Amen, amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. You know, I'm extremely happy to be in Bible study yet another time to share, you know, on our topic that we have been discussing, you know, the rejected and the accepted king. Amen. And I believe that, you know, there is a word for somebody. And I believe that the Lord has been speaking to us. He has been speaking to me as an individual. And, you know, as I prepare, as I speak, you know, some of the things are not even on script, but, you know, God is doing a thing. Amen. And before we proceed tonight, I want to pray. So let us just pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We magnify you. We glorify you. There is none like you, none to be compared to you. We bless your name and we give you all the glory and the honor that is due unto your name. We pray, mighty God, that you be in our midst as we Lord Jesus, share a word. We ask that you will use the word that is uttered, mighty God, to accomplish your glory. We pray, God, that when all is said and done, that lives will be saved, lives will be touched, and that people will be saved. Let your will be done tonight as we give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me say welcome again, wherever you are tuning in from. Wherever in the world you are and you're tuning in, we, you know, give God thanks for having you. And we pray that, you know, you will receive something in your spirit tonight. Amen. So we have been looking at the rejected and the accepted kings, right? And our key scripture, our scripture is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 15, from verse 18 through to 28. And our key verse is verse 26. And, you know, for time's sake, we are just going to read um, 26, right? That is First Samuel 15, 26. And Sam Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Amen. So... One of the things that, you know, I want to bring to memory to tonight is that when Saul was rejected from being king, it was not just a rejection from, from not being king over Israel, but what it meant was that the spirit of the Lord would have departed from Saul. And, you know, when the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, the Bible says an evil spirit came and attached himself to Saul. And Saul had to get somebody that was skillful in playing music to relieve him from the torment that he was going through. So when we reached that section in the lesson and we were saying that God would reject us, I want us to understand that it is saying to us that, you know, there comes a time when the Lord will prod us, the Lord will talk with us. But there comes a time if we choose to refuse, if we re refuse to, to, to accept the way of the Lord, if we refuse to live by the commandment of the Lord, then God in turn will reject us. Similarly, like how he rejected Saul, and the spirit of the Lord will become dormant in our lives. Amen. And we will find ourselves, you know, in sin and heading to a devil's hell. I want to encourage us, even before I, you know, do the recap on anything, that we, you know, should try our very best to, to, to live a life pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. It's so like something that we say over and over, you know, but it's extremely important. If it's not pleasing to the Lord, then who are we pleasing, right? The Bible says that that. Saul, King Saul, he rejected the way of the Lord. He rejected the commandment of the Lord. And the Lord, the Lord, if we look at the life of David, yes, David instructed, the Lord instructed David, and David carried out, as a matter of fact, when we, the last time we were here, we look at the many times that David inquired of the Lord, right? David was in hiding, we said, and the Philistine 
robbed the threshing floor. They were raiding the city of Keilah. And David inquired of the Lord. Though, though the man was in hiding, his passion for his country, his passion for his people, the, the heart of the man wanted him to go and, and, and deliver the people. And he sought the Lord. And the Lord said, go because I will deliver the Philistine into thine hands. And the men with David, they were afraid. And David inquired of the Lord a second time. And the Lord said, go. Right? When David was in the city of Keilah, the, the Bible says that David heard that Saul was coming to the city to destroy the city because David was there. And David inquired of the Lord and he said, will Saul come down? And the Lord said, Saul will come down. And then he go to God and inquired a fourth time of the Lord. And he said, will the men of Keilah give me to Saul? And God said, they will hand you over to Saul. And David, you know, left. But we spoke often, you know, when we read in the scripture, we recognize the many times that David, you know, the type of relationship that he had with the Lord. And the many times, you know, when David was going into battle, one of the things that he made sure that he did was to inquire of the Lord. And I, we, we look at it and we say that, you know, it is important as people of God, as children of the living God, to inquire of the Lord because we don't just want to do things, you know, on our own. We don't just want to do things by, you know, our way because we are being bought with a price and we are not our own and we want to do you know, the will of God, you know, I would, you know, that we emulate David's example, you know, to cultivate an habit of inquiring, of seeking the Lord and waiting for his answer. Because if there's anything about David, David inquired of the Lord and he wait also upon the Lord, right? So it's important for us as people of God, as children of God, to seek direction from the Lord in prayer and fasting so that we might know his will for our life, right? So David, we said, we can go to the slides. So David, we said, was a man of his word, right? And David <clears throat> gave his word and he remain true, he remained faithful to the promise that he made. This was something that we mentioned the last time, but we're just going into some things that we did not get the chance to go into, and we are going into, into it. So in 1 Samuel chapter 20, 14 to 17, I think we have it on the slide there, right? So David was a man of his word when he gave his word, Right, he, 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 the type of man that he was, the type of individual that he was, he, wa he wanted to remain true to his word. And when you find individuals, you can, you, you, you can tell individuals, you know, when they give you their word, right, and they stand by it, they remain true to it, you can say, look here, this is a genuine person. But if the person gives you their word, and, you know, when you're calling them on the phone and you're not getting them, you, you, you would look at the person and say, look here, this person is a trickster. This person is a liar, right? And as people of God, no one wants, you know, as people of God, for somebody to say of us that we are liars, right? So David was a man of his word in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14 to 17. We see where David promised Jonathan that he would not cut off his love from the house of Saul after Jonathan was gone. And the scripture read, and thou shalt not, so this was Jonathan that was saying to David, and thou shalt not, only while yet I live, show me the kindness of the Lord, that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off my, thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord had cut off the enemies of David, everyone from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, let the Lord even require it of the hand of David's enemy. 
Amen. And verse 17, and Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. So David, we said now, is a covenant-keeping man after the death of King Saul and his son Jonathan. David discovered indeed that there was a, 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 a son of Jonathan who was crippled at the age of five and is still alive, and his name was Miphi Boshet. So David, after he inquired and he found out that this son was alive, he sent, you know, that the people might take Miphi Boshet to him, right? So David said in verse 7, he said, do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, David showed kindness to Mephibosheth because he made a promise to Jonathan. David kept his word, right? He made the promise to Jonathan before he became king. And after he ascended to the throne, he kept his promise. He did not forget. He was mindful of his promise. Amen. He kept his words. Right? And as people of God, it's important to keep our words. It's important that when we make a promise to an individual or we make a promise to the Lord, that we keep the promise. We should not waver, but we should try our very best to keep our promises. Right? So the scripture in Ecclesiastic 5, verse 2, and we read it from the New Liv Living Translation, right? It said, do not make rash promises and do not be hasty in bringing matters before God. After all, God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. The, the Bible is not telling us, you know, that our words should just, you know, be Meaning, what the Bible is saying to us is that we should not open our mouths to make promises that we are not able to keep. So if we find ourselves, you know, trying to make promises and try, we don't want to disappoint anybody and we want to, you know, try and please everybody, it's it, it not going to happen like that. There are times you are going to have to say, brother, I am not sure if I am able to to do that. So do not make rash promises and do not be hasty to bring in matters before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. But listen to what the next scripture says now. In the same book of Ecclesiastic chapter 5, right? It says, it is better, oh glory, not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. So if you cannot fulfill it in the first place, don't vow a vow. Don't say, look here, I am going to do the thing. So don't say you are going to do it, and then you don't do it. It is, it is not right. Like I said earlier, people will look at you as a liar because you're not true to your words. Anytime you're not true to your words, People will consider you as a liar. So if you say that you are going to do it, try your very best and do it. So sometimes we make promises to the Lord. And we don't remain true to our promises. Lord, I am not going to do this thing again. But after a certain time, we'll find ourselves doing the same thing. And we make the promise to the Lord with all good intention because, you know, our heart's desire is to serve him. Our heart's desire is to please him. But sometimes we say to the Lord, Lord, I am not going to do the thing again. And a little bit after you find yourself doing the same thing. I remember years ago as a young Christian, you know, I fell and I said, God, this thing not happening again, and I prayed the prayer. And you see, because I made the promise of God, I made the promise to God, 
what happened? The thing happened again. I must say, oh, my God. And you know, I go back and make another promise to the Lord. Right? And I say, because, you know, sometimes we make the promise to God. And what it does is that, you know, when you fear the Lord, you say, you know, we make the promise to God and, and, and Lord. You know, I remember the other day. Let me just confess a little bit. The other day. You know, I don't go, I don't go on TikTok and, and, and the others. You know, I stick to YouTube some of the time. And, you know, there's this section on YouTube that it just keep popping up. And when you click on it, it's a million, you see videos, 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 videos. And, you know, I find myself streaming. And I say, God, you know, I make a promise to God. I say, God, look here. I now go back on this thing, you know, because this thing is, 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 is keeping up the time, the time that I should spend with you. And I just made a promise to God. For me, when I make a promise to God, because, you know, there is this fear in the Lord. So if you're not true to your words, God will judge you. You know what I do? Try my very best. So if I want to stop do something, all I have to, so, to do, you know, is say, God, I am not. I promise you that I won't do it again. And there is just this fear because I make the promise to God that I am. But sometimes... We make the promise to the Lord and we do not remain true to our words. Right? We do it with all good intention because in our heart we want to serve him. However, we fail to keep our word. But it is better, the Bible in Ecclesiastic 5 verse 5 says, not to make a vow than to make a vow. Right? And even when it comes to your brethren, it is better to say, brother, brother, I am not sure. I'm not sure, my brother in the Lord, that I am able to help you. I'm not sure that, you know, I can do that right now. But as long as you open your mouth and you say, brother, I will do this. Let us do our very best to honor our words. And you, have you ever made a promise and then not followed up? Make a promise and you don't follow through? You had good intention when you made, because you want to help. But something got in the way and prevented you from keeping your words. Right? You see, in life, there are times when circumstance may prevent us from making good and our good intention. You know, and, and sometimes the pressures of life, the pressures of the job will cause us to forget the promise that we make. Something happened and you just don't remember, right? So what we can do is try to make it right with the individual, try to make it right with the Lord. Say, Lord, boy, you know, I open my mouth and I do it with all in good intention because, you know, I really want to serve you. But, you know, I, I, I falter. Lord, help me. Right? And as, as best as we can, we should try our very best to please the Lord. If we falter, we need to ask God to forgive me. We need to ask the individual that we disappoint. Brethren, I did it with all good intention. I'm asking you to forgive me. Let me... See if I can do it now. But don't let it be that you make a promise to your brother. Right? And the person is calling you. You say, check me next week. And the person is calling you and you ignore the phone call. The person is calling you and you turn off your phone. The person wants to WhatsApp you, you block them. Almighty God, I am saying to us as individuals, people of God, Christians, that we should be true to our words. I made the promise, but I was not able to come through this time. Don't hide from the person, man. I will try and do it another time. But if you hide from the person, the person is going to have you as a liar. You, you don't want to be branded as a liar, as a child of God. It just don't work out. So it is better, the Bible says, right, not to make a vow than to make it and do not fulfill it. So David made the promise to Jonathan. Jonathan made him swear and he 
made the promise to Jonathan before he was king. And after he became king, he tried to fulfill the promise. And he fulfilled it. He found that Jonathan had a son and he said, bring Mephibosheth to the, to the, to the, to the, to the castle so that I can show him the kindness. He said, I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. So David was a man of his word. Then David was also kind-hearted, right? We're still looking at David's character, you know? and David is, was kind-hearted. So though David was a man of war, here we see another side of David, another side of the warrior king and 2 Samuel 9, verse 6 through to 8. But David was, was a warrior. Remember, we're saying, you know, as long as you said war for the right thing, David was ready to fight. He was ready to war. Remember, he was in hiding, and the Philistine went into the city of Keel, and David, though he was in hiding, he was ready to fight. And Saul's servant identified him as a man of war. But he also said that David was prudent in matters, and he was kind hearted. So though he was a man of war, though he was ready to war, David was a man that was kind hearted. So look at what the scripture said. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence and said, Mephibosheth, and David said, Mephibosheth. And he said, answer, behold thy servant. And David said unto him, fear not. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan's sake. And will restore thee all the lands of Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually and he bowed himself and said what is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am so Mephibosheth was saying look here me unworthy me not worthy of this you know I am not worthy to be eating at the king's table I am not worthy for you to restore unto me all the things of my grandfather But it just shows the kindness of David. David showed kindness to Jonathan's host through Mephibosheth. He did so by giving him all the belonging of his grandfather. And he gave him a seat at the king's table. He demonstrated the kind of love. He demonstrated the kind of love. The kind of covenant love. Right? That was that the the, 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 the Apostle John described in 1 John 3, verses 18, right? Verse 18, he said, love not in word, but in deed and in truth. Love not in word, love not in talk, but love in deed and truth. And David, kindness to Mephibosheth demonstrate a kind of covenant love. He made a promise to Jonathan before he was king and after he remained, after he became king, he fulfilled the promise. But by fulfilling the promise, it shows the heart of the man, how kind the man was. So in those days, it was a common practice, you know, that the incoming king would kill any relative of the former king to negate any threat of his throne. Mephibosheth knew this 
So when, the, when, Mephibosheth, when David said, Mephibosheth, he said, he, yes, hear my your servant. Because he knew this was the way of the kings. He knew that being the grandson of Saul, he could have been easily wiped out. This was expected by Mephibosheth. But though he was expecting a sword, he found a seat at the most prestigious table in the land. Why? Because David was kind-hearted and he made a promise to Mephibosheth's father and King Saul and he made good on it. I want us to understand that this was true kindness that was shown to Mephibosheth by David. He was expecting a sword, but he got a seat at the king's table. I want us to know that this kind of kindness, Mephibosheth was not really worthy of. He was not worthy of. Why? Because Look here. His grandfather spent a good deal of time trying to kill David. Can, how many of us would find it in our heart to treat the relative of somebody that was trying to kill us for years? But David found it in his heart. That's why the Bible, that is one of the reasons why the Bible talk. He found it in his heart to show kindness to the relative of somebody that chased him down for years trying to kill him. And just as old Mephibosheth was, was not worthy of this kind of kindness, so it is that we are not worthy of the kindness of God. We are recipients of the kindness of God. Just as old Mephibosheth was a recipient of the kindness of God, of, of, of David, so we are we recipients of the kindness of God. While we don't deserve it, the Bible here in Romans 5 verse 8, it says, But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We are undeserving of this kind of kindness, right, that the Lord has shown to us. While we were of another heritage, Jesus died for us. We are the Mephibosheths in the story. And Jesus had not only restored us from judgment, but has invite, invited us to sit at the table as part of his family. What a privilege we have. So we are no more bastards, but we are sons. No, are we the sons of God? The Bible says, as many that are led by the Spirit are the sons. No, we are the sons of God. We are no more bastard. We are no longer far from the commonwealth of Israel. But no, we, in Christ Jesus, have been brought near to the Lord through his blood. The Bible says that we were far from the commonwealth of Israel. We were in the present world without hope. We thought God, oh glory. But because of the kindness of God, because of his kindness, we have become sons of God. We were undeserving of this kind of kindness, but no, we are his son. So just as David showed kindness to Mephibosheth in a similar way. In a similar way, the Lord shows kindness to us. What a privilege we have. We are privileged people. While we were of another heritage, God loved us. He commended his love towards us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
what kindness. Amen. So we want to move on. We want to know, look at David respected the Lord's anointed. In 1 Samuel chapter 24 and 1 Samuel chapter 26, the, 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 the chapters are virt, virtually identical in their plot. In that both begin with Saul learning where David was, learn where David was hiding out. Then both chapters show that David refused to harm Saul, the Lord's anointed. And then both concluded with Saul recognizing that David was more righteous than him. When you read through the the, the, the first Samuel chapter 24, when David showed Saul the piece of his garment and, and expressed that, you know, this is your garment. It shows that I don't have anything against you. The Bible says that Saul wept and he said, thou shalt surely this is in chapter 24, you know. He said, thou shalt surely become king in Israel. But then in chapter 26, King Saul still seek to kill David. Even though in chapter 24, he wept and he recognized that David was a more righteous man than him. He said to David, you will become king. In chapter 26, it says that Saul again tried to seek the life of David. But what we will do for tonight, we will not look at both chapter 24 and chapter 26. Right? But we will look at chapter 24, you know, just for what we are doing tonight. Because both, you know, chapters are similar. So first chapter, first Samuel chapter 24, from verse 1 through to verse 7. And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep courts. By the way, where was a cave? And Saul went into the, the into cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemies into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterwards that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. The Lord's anointed to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. So as we look at the passage, we can conclude, we can conclude that David showed great kindness. David showed great kindness and respect to King Saul. 
we just mentioned that David showed kindness to the house of Saul after he became king. They found Mephibosheth, the, the, the grandson of Saul, the son of Jonathan, and he restored unto him all that belonged to his grandfather. And he gave him a seat at the king's table. But this was before that. And it showed the heart, the kindness of the man's heart, that he was kind even in sparing the life of Saul. But he also showed great respect to the king. So Saul seek to take the life of David. However, the Lord kept him. Many occasions, many times, the, 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 the David, the, the Saul seek to take the life of David, but the Lord kept him and the Lord delivered. When we go down further in the scripture, when the prophet confronted David, you will hear the Lord say through the prophet that, you know, I was the one that delivered you from Saul. But Saul seek to take his life. And David and his men were in a cave. No, the Bible says that David, that Saul chose some soldiers. And these were not normal soldiers. It says 3,000 chosen men. These were not ordinary soldiers, you know. These were warriors. And Saul selected these warriors to go and hunt the life of David. They were hunting David and the 600 men that were with him. David and his men were in the cave. And King Saul came in the cave to relieve himself. So somebody was wondering how David get to cut off the robe of Saul while Saul was relieving himself, so he probably would have taken off the robe to, and then went to relieve himself. What are the chances? What are the chances? What are the chances that your enemy, the one that is seeking your life, comes to relieve himself in a cave that you were hiding in. David knew very well that Saul feared him. He knew very well that Saul, that Saul feared him after it was sung in Israel that Saul had slain his thousand and David is ten thousand. Saul tried to kill David and David knew that Saul feared him. And how did Saul try to kill David? Saul encouraged one of his servants and tell his servants, look here, what you need to do is to tell David to, you know, marry my daughter. And when the servant went to David and said, you know, Saul wanted to marry his, his daughter, David said, I cannot do that. Do you know the responsibility that comes with marrying the king's daughter? And when the, the, the servant went back to Saul, Saul said to him, no, tell him that all I require of him is a one, the foreskin of 100 Philistines. And he did so because he wanted David to die. He wanted the, the Philistine to kill David while he was trying to get the 100 foreskin. But the Bible said when David heard that, he was glad. And David brought back this foreskin of 200 Philistines. The Bible says that when Saul saw that David brought back the foreskin of 200 Philistines, fear fell upon him. The King Saul was fearful of David, and he tried to kill David many times. But David brought back the foreskin of 200 Philistines. So here it is that the occasion came. Hallelujah. The occasion came where David could have killed King Saul, but he decided to spare his life. David was encouraged by his men. Behold, the day in which the Lord said unto thee, I will deliver thine enemy 
into thine hand. That thou mayest do to him as you see fit. How many of us, oh glory to God, could have resisted touching the Lord's anointed after being encouraged to do so? David replied, I will not stretch out my hand against my, you look at David, address him as my Lord. He said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. The principle of not striking out against God's anointed leader is a good and important one, and we'll get to it in a little while, but I would also like to remind us that your brother, not necessarily a leader, but your brother, the person that you look on as the least in the kingdom of God, is the Lord's anointed. So when we sit and we talk, our brother, the person that you think, you don't think much of that person, and you talk, that, to that, talk about that brother with the intent to hurt him, I want you to understand that you have to answer to God because he is the Lord's anointed. He's not just the bishop. He's not just the pastor. He's, he's not just the deacons are the Lord's. And your brother, if the Lord invested in him, if the Lord invested in her, if the God baptized them with the Holy Spirit, they are the Lord's anointed. And we will have to answer to God if we are malicious in our speech against our brother. The Bible in Matthew 5, 21 and 22 says this, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you should not murder. And whosoever murder will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, that whosoever is angry with his brother, without a car, shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever says to his brother, Raka, which means the person is empty or the person is worthless, worthless one, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So here, Jesus was giving a lesson about sin. And he was saying that we do not have to actually do the act of sin. In essence, from we entertain the thought, we have sinned. So if, if it's a leader or if it's the person that we consider the least among us, we don't have to touch them. Once we set ourselves to speak evil of them, to harm them, we are guilty and we have to answer to the Lord. In the case of Saul, he was king and he was the leader of Israel. David said, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. Look, look at the heart of the man. David was running for his life. He was hiding. He and the 600 men that were with him were hiding in a cave. They were hiding from Saul that came into the cave to relieve himself. David had the opportunity to kill Saul and the men that were with David encouraged him to kill Saul and David still called the man master. He said, I will not do this thing. The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. How many of us could, could look at a man like that and still call him master? How many of us could look at a man like that, get the opportunity to kill him, 
and refuse and still call him master. It shows that David's heart was, was at a good place. It shows that David's heart was, was in a right place. This was the, the state of the man's heart. Even though the man was being haunted by Saul, the man harbored nothing in his heart. Hallelujah. He harbored nothing in his heart against King Saul. He said, I will not stretch forth my hand and touch the Lord's anointed. Seeing that he is anointed of the Lord. The Lord forbid, the Lord forbid that I should touch my master. This was the state of the man's heart. The man's heart was, was in a place. Some folks, some folks are not even afraid to speak ill of their leaders. So, we are in a a church setting, and the leaders that God place in the church to watch over your soul, folks are not afraid to speak ill of their leaders. They think that it is okay to say what they want about their leaders, and I am saying to us, as people of God, once there is ill intent, you have to answer to the Lord. If you don't have anything good to say. Some folks would say that. Don't say anything. But if you find that there is something that you, you wonder, talk to God about it, no? The leader that God placed to watch over your soul is a man. And we can talk to God if we see something that, that we say, you know that, I think that the thing can be done this way. But let me pray that, you know, God will open up. And God give us good leaders, leaders that we can come and say, and talk to. But folks are not afraid to speak ill of the leaders. Remember now, promotion comes neither from the east nor from the west, but it comes from God. So the leaders that God installed in the church, look here, none of us went to Bishop Grizzle and said, Bishop Grizzle, you know, I have some money and I want, you know, I want because I have money that you put us, you know, as leaders in the church. Nobody went to Bishop Daly and said, Bishop Daly, I have some money and because I have money, you know, because I have assets, I want you to put me up as a leader. No. They sought the Lord, and the Lord selected the leaders and installed them. So if you speak ill against the leader, you know, it is the leader that God put there that you're speaking ill against. And folks are not afraid in this time to open up their mouth and talk against the leaders. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. David said, but David said, look here, I will not, I will not do this thing unto my master and to the Lord's anointed. Remember, we read the scripture in Matthew, you know. The scripture in Matthew said you don't have to touch the bishop. You don't have to touch the deacon. You don't have to touch the elder. But once you open up your mouth. Oh, hallelujah. Once you talk, God with heal intent. You will have to, we will have to answer to God. Look at the scripture now in Numbers chapter 24, 1 through to 12. We'll find that one. We'll look at it. Right? Miriam and Aaron spoke against the anointed, the Lord's anointed. And at that time, the, the anointed man at that time, the anointed man at that time was Moses. 
And the Bible says that the Lord was very angry with them. So they open their mouth and they speak against Moses as if it was a light thing. And when we open up our mouth and, and speak against, speak ill against the leader, we, we want to, to tarnish their reputation. I want us to understand that the Lord will judge us for it. Hallelujah. So Miriam and Aaron opened up their mouth and spoke against the Lord's anointed. Let us go to the, 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 the passage. And Miriam and Aaron speak against Moses because of, the, because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Had the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Had he not spoken also by us? And the Lord, heard, look here, you see, if you, the, the leader might not hear it. But the Lord himself will hear it. And the Lord will act. Next scripture. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out he three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And the, they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam and they both came forth. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision. And I will speak to him in dreams. So, so he was saying that the prophet, if there was a prophet in the land, you know, he would make himself known to that prophet by vision. And he will speak to them by dream. Remember when Joseph, when Joseph interpreted Fira, his dream, fear a dream, you know. And Joseph, because of the Lord, was with him, right? So if he would speak to anybody through visions and dream, right? And Joseph was able to interpret the, 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 the dream of fear. But God is saying here that if there was a man, he would talk to them. But look what he said about Moses. He said, my servant Moses is not so, he's not a prophet. I don't talk to him by vision. I don't talk to him by dream. He said, my servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. He said, with him, I speak mouth not in visions and not in dream. I speak to him mouth to mouth even apparently and not in dark speeches and the similitude of the lord shall he behold wherefore then were he not afraid and this is what i'm saying when you your leader that god installed when god talked to him the man that is watching over your soul the man that has to give an answer for your soul when you talk badly about him God will hear, and God was saying to them, were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And God might be saying to us, are you not afraid to speak of my servant? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And the old Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was lepro, leprous. 
And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now. O oh God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days. And after that, let her be received in again. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days. And the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. So the Bible says that God was angry. And when he let Miriam, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. This happened because she talked against Moses, the man of God. Miriam and Aaron used the fact that Moses was married to Zipporah, which was a Midianite. Used her as an excuse to talk against Moses. And sometimes we use some things to talk against the man of God, not understanding. Look here, you see, when God, if God have a man to lead his people, you think that God going to talk to somebody else before he talk to the leader? When Adam sinned, Adam and Eve sin. The Lord said, remember, the man was dead, you know. And remember, L L Adam, where art thou? He did not call for Eve. Adam, where art thou? And look here, when he, began, when he spoke, he spoke to Adam. He said, Adam, what is this? You know how he talked to the woman? Adam said, the woman that you gave me. So the Lord will talk to the head. He will talk to the leader. So sometimes folks might think that I know the leader alone I hear from. Me I hear from God too. Yes, but God will. That's what, that's what Miriam and Aaron, we hear from God too. But the Lord heard it and was angry. Next slide. So they use the wife. of Moses, the Midianite, as an excuse, but she was a worshiper of God. And they used it as an excuse to rebel against the authority that was given to Moses. Miriam claimed equality with Moses, ignoring the fact that God had placed Moses in a unique position of authority by asking had the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses yet had he not spoken also by us the fundamental mistake of Miriam was one of disrespect For and rebellion against. Disrespect and rebellion against. The authority that was given to Moses by the Lord. In these last days, we have seen a lot of people mixing up enlightenment and rebellion. A lot of folk are rebelling against the leader that is installed to, 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 to guide them 
along the path that the Lord wants them to go, and people are rebelling. The, the, the leader is preaching holiness, and people don't want to hear that. Talking about living according to God's word, and people don't want it. People are rebelling against the things that have been set up to keep their soul. Anything that is set up to keep my soul, I try my very best to welcome it. So the fundamental mistake was one of disrespect and one of rebellion, and a lot of people are disrespecting the leader that is installed, and they are, disres they are rebelling against the, the, the principles of the Lord and, and, and the things that the leader has set out to keep their soul alive. And people are mixing up enlightenment and rebellion, not knowing that there is a spirit at work. There is a spirit behind the rebellion. And we unmask in the spirit that you might understand that that is a spirit that you have allowed to come into your, your quarters, have allowed to come into your life. That is why you have that rebellion behavior. And King Saul was a rebellious man. He was rebelling against the word of God. He was rebelling against the command, command of God. And God said, look here, I am going to put you away. The kingdom shall be reigned from you. And the Lord took the kingdom from him and removed his spirit from him. Because of rebellion. Brethren, I want us to be careful tonight. I want us to be careful. I want us to look into the word of God. Look into what the word of God is saying to us. If the principles are dear, the landmarks are dear, some things that are dear to separate you from the world. The Bible says, come out from among them and be is separate and touch not the unclean things. And the, the leader is fighting so hard for the church not to be like the world. And the church is fighting to be like the world. Ara. But brethren, I speak to us tonight as people of God. Let us not rebel against the things that are dear to keep our soul. The things that are dear to keep us from faltering. But let us embrace, you know, godliness. Let us embrace righteousness. So Miriam and, Mo, uh, and Aaron spoke out against Moses and, and, and they rebelled. They disrespected him and they rebelled. And Miriam was smitten with leprous. And sometimes we see things happening to members. Not knowing that things happen to members because they open up their mouth against the leader. Yes, sometimes things happen to people and it happens because they open. That is what we read. Miriam opened her mouth and, and she was struck with leprosy. And sometimes some things happen to folks and we don't understand why it happened, but it is because they open up their mouth against the leader that God has installed to guide them to watch over their souls. And sometimes things happen, and the same leader, it was Aaron that went to Moses and said, Moses, don't make our sin come down and talk to God. And some folks talk against the leader, and they are sick, and they have to come back to the same leader. And the same leader have to lay his hands on them and pray. Miriam repented and was later forgiven of her sins. I want us as people of God to know that the leaders that we see are installed by God. David did not have the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God overshadowed him. 
But we have the Spirit of God live in us. And we are not afraid to open our mouth. But David, who had the Spirit overshadowing him, said, I will not. It's two different eras, you know. It's two different eras, but David said, I will not touch my master, the Lord's anointed. I think sometimes we, we, we take the Lord too simple. Virgin don't mix up enlightenment and rebellion. Right? And if things are put there to keep you, to keep your soul, to keep the soul of your brother, don't rebel against these things, man. Next slide. So the Bible says that David heart smote him. 1 Samuel 24, 4 to 5. And the men of David said unto him. So these men of David that were with him, you know, remember that they were also running for their lives, you know, because it wants, these men were supporting David. When King Saul was anointed, right? The Bible says that a group of men followed Saul. And so David was anointed and he slew Goliath. A group of men followed him. And these men that were encouraging David were running for their lives. Also, And the men of David said unto him, Behold the day which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it seemed good unto them. Then David arose and cut off the skirt, the skirt of Saul's robe. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut up Saul's skirt. So David cut off Saul's, a section of Saul's robe. And his heart smote him. What? For, for such a simple thing, you're saying that a man that was overshadowed by the Holy Ghost, right, he cut off a section of the, the, the robe of the king and his heart smote him. For such a simple thing, it might seem simple to us. But to David, it was a big thing. You know, there are, I, I have come to realize there are some things that God will convict you are about. And if you do that thing, you feel so bad. But, and I have not reached that level that you have reached, so, if, so, so I won't be convicted about that. But I have also found out that there are some things that the Lord will convict me about. If I do them, I mean no my sin against God. But if you do them, so, where we are in our relationship with God. God will convict us about some things. So the thing might look simple to us, you know. But it was not a simple thing to David. This was how David's heart was towards the man, the man that was trying to kill him. David just cut a small piece of his garment and, and the man's heart smote him. David's heart smote him because his conscience was alive. When a man's conscience is alive, it, has a, it is a good thing because he can be corrected by the Holy Spirit. 
some define conscience, the conscience as the inner voice that warns us. Another say that the conscience is what hurts when everything else feels good. So it might seem good to you and you might be enjoying the thing, but your conscience is telling you that the thing is wrong. In essence, the conscience is something that God has placed in every man and every woman. It is something innate. We are all born with a conscience, right? It is that sense of right and wrong, good and evil. It is an alarm, if you please. You're going to do something wrong. The alarm comes on and says, you're doing something, or you're going to do something that is wrong. It will prompt you before you do the wrong thing. And if you do the wrong thing, it will prompt you to repent. This is a life conscience. As Christians, our conscience must be alive. I want us to understand that when the Holy Spirit comes into us, the Holy Spirit makes our conscience alive. When our conscience is alive, the Lord is able to speak to us. The Lord will be able to guide us along the path that he wants to go. That is why I said earlier on that we can be convicted of something and we do it and it is wrong and somebody else do it and to them it's not wrong because our conscience, the Holy Spirit talked to us and said, don't do it. Our conscience is alive when the, whole, the Holy Spirit comes and couples with our spirit. And our conscience become alive. And the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us. God will talk to us through our consciences. Right? He will talk to us through our conscience. And we will receive. When our conscience is alive, God will talk to us. We are seen in the church arena right now. Right? We are... You have to wonder if people that should be saved, if their conscience is dead, or they are presumptuously going against the prompting of the Lord. King Saul must have been prompted that what you're doing is wrong. But he presumptuously, and we said it, he presumptuously went against the prompting of the Lord. The Lord sent the prophet to him, and the prophet said, this is what you must do. And Saul presumptuously, he willfully went against the command of the Lord. In the church arena, what we are seeing right now, to the behavior of people. Their conscience is either dead or they are presumptuously going against the prompting of the Lord. I want us to understand that a living man with a dead conscience is as good as dead. This is an individual that is alive. He, he has breath. Not saved. Conscience is dead. His conscience is cool. He's just as good as dead. But a living man with a live conscience will have mercy. Why? Because he that confesseth and forsake his sin shall have mercy. So when the living man falls seven times, his conscience will prompt him to get up. Make it right with God. His conscience will, will have that sorrow. But the man with a dead conscience will have no sorrow for what he has done. He will have no godly sorrows. 
for the sins that he has done. The state of our conscience is the state of our life. And you can tell by the behavior of some folks that are supposed to be saved that the conscience is dead. Brethren, it doesn't make any sense that we come to church Sunday after Sunday, and I've been saying it time and time, that we come to church Sunday after Sunday, and we dress up and come to church so that a, a, a calendar, so that a register can be marked to say that person is present at church, but in your heart, you are far from God. The state of our conscience is the state of our life. And David's conscience smote him because his conscience was, the Bible says his heart smote him, but really it was his conscience that spoke to him and said, that is wrong, and he felt so bad for just cutting off a section of Saul's robe. He felt so bad. This was the heart that the man had. Just a section. And sometimes we do things, sometimes we say things, and we sin. And the conscience is so dead that there is no correction. We do the things so often, it becomes a norm. The conscience stops speaking to us because it becomes a part of us. David spared Saul because he was the Lord's anointed, right? David decided to spear Saul because he knew what God's promise said. David knew what God promised. Said. He knew that when he was anointed, that there would become a time when he would be king. Over. If there is anything about the promise of the Lord, the promise of the Lord is sure. David showed respect to the Lord's anointed. And he speared him because he knew what the promise of God said. How many of us know what the promise of God say for our life? How many of us know what the Lord, some of the things that the Lord have in store for, for us? Oh, you know, God will reveal things to his friends. And sometimes when we have a promise from God, we think that we are justified in sinning to pursue the promise of the Lord. But there is no such thing. We are not justified in sinning to pursue the promise of the Lord. It is uh, the devil is a liar, somebody. The adversary wants you to think that since God promised you, right, you can do anything to, to get that thing that the Lord, but it's not so. Devil is a liar. The God will fulfill his promise, promises to you. However, he chooses to do so. He will do it his way. He will do it in his timing. He will do it right. You want to know if, if, if the thing is really from God, it is done righteously. David did not try to fulfill the promise the Lord made to him by killing Saul. He knew not only how to wait on the Lord, but he also knew how to wait for the Lord. Waiting on the Lord by prayer and supplication 
looking forward to the indication of his will. We wait for the Lord by patient and submission, looking for the intervention of his hand. David was determined that when he sat on the throne of Israel, it wouldn't be because he got Saul out of the way, but because God got Saul out of the way. He wanted God's fingerprint on the work. He did not want his own, and he wanted a clean conscience. How many of us want a clean conscience in the things that we do? How many of us want God's fingerprint to be all over our life, to be all over our situation, to be all over the things that we set to achieve? David was willing. David was willing to allow God to do the work. I would rather to have God finger, God's fingerprint over everything that I do. Amen, somebody. So the heart of David, David's heart was, was, was a heart of hearts. Because the man that was trying to kill him, the man that, that, that seek to take his life for years, David still call, he still refer to the man as master. He still refer to the man as the Lord's anointed. It shows you where the heart of the man was. So we now want to look at David's response to his sin. Just like Saul, King David too was would commit some horrific, horrific sin. But his response was very different from Saul. And the scripture for that is 2 Samuel 11, 1 to 17. So Saul sinned, and when Saul was confronted, when Saul was confronted, Saul said, I did what the Lord commanded me to do. And even when the prophet was saying to him, no, Saul was saying, I did what the Lord wanted me to do. It was not until he heard that the kingdom would be rent from him, then he came to the point and he said, look here, I have sinned. But there was nothing of repentance behind it. There was no godly sorrow. He just wanted to, to, sh to show on the outside that, you know, something like, you know, he was, was sorry for what he did. But on the inside, there was nothing. But David responded different. To his sin. The prophet Saul confronted, Samuel confronted King Saul. And the prophet Nathan confronted David. When the prophet called David out of his adultery and conspiracy of murder, David's response was different. So both were anointed king and both sinned. Let us look now at 2 Samuel 11. You know, we're just doing a little bit of reading now, 1 through to 17. And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go to battle, that David sent Joab and his servant with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon, and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass, in an evening tide, that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. 
And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David said, sent and inquired after the woman. And one of said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? So David knew that she was married. One said to David that she is the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thine house, and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and went not down to his house. So David was trying to cover up. But Uriah did not go down to his house. He slept at the gate. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. And when they told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Comest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab, and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open field. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, tarry here today also. And tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the, the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him. And he made him drunk. So David sent him down to his house with meat and him don't go. So this time David drunk him. Said so him drunk, he will go down to his house, sleep with his wife and you know, he will get a jacket, right? And at, and at evening, he went out to lie on his bed with the servant of his Lord, but went not. So he went in try to joke the man. Uriah went not down to his house. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Look here, this is a wicked thing, you know. Because David wrote a letter and he sent it by Uriah. Look what the letter says. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set E Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire he from him that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that the valiant man were. 
And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people. And the servants of David and Uriah the Hittite died also. So David, it was a time when kings went to battle, but David chose not to go to battle. And he stayed home. He stayed home. And he did not choose to fight with his servants. He went out on his balcony and he saw Bathsheba from the balcony. He inquired of her and come and it was told to him that look here, this was a married woman. But he sent for her. He sent for her and committed adultery with her. But Sheba got pregnant and David tried to cover up. When this did not work, David murdered Uriah. David had a relationship with God. We spoke the last time and we said that David inquired of the Lord everything that he was doing, most of the things that he was doing. He, he tried to find the mind of God. But here he came up on a situation where he, he didn't even have to find the mind of God because he knew that the lady was married. But he sent for the lady anyhow, got the lady pregnant, committed adultery, tried to cover it up, and when that didn't work, he committed murder. So, but he had a relationship with God, and yet he sinned. Irrespective of who we are and how good our relationship is with God, the best of us will fall at times. And David had a relationship with God, often inquired of the Lord, and yet he fall. We are both just men, and, and being men, at times we will fall. But when we fall, what are we going to do? So the prophet, now Nathan, would confront him, Second Samuel 12, 1 through to 9. We're going to look at that. And the prophet con confronted him. And the Lord. So Uriah died. And David thought that everything was all right. Thought that this was it. You know, nothing, nobody knows. And, and the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. And the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And he grew up together with him and with his children. He did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man. And he appeared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man, but took the poor man, slam, and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that had done this thing shall surely die. And he 
and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thou say the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and have I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wife into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore, hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord? The very same thing that Saul did, you know, despise the commandment of the Lord. Saul despised the commandment of the Lord and Samuel, uh, Samuel the prophet went to him and here we see David despised the, because he knew that you must take a man wife. You can commit adultery. But he despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. David, when the prophet, when the prophet confronted him, took ownership of his sin rather than making excuse. David said in verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. David did not only accept his sin, but he was sorry for his wrongdoing. David took ownership of his sin rather than making excuse. And he said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. David described in details the thoughts and emotion he was experiencing during this time. In Psalm 51, David wrote out, calling out to God for mercy and said, For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. David owned up to his sin, but Saul refused to own up to his sin. David owned his sin and was truly broken. He lay himself before the Lord, asking for forgiveness and restitution. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly, he said, from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sins. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. I create in me a clean heart. And Renew within me a right spirit. Cast me not away from thy presence, he said. And take not thine Holy Spirit from me. David was witness to see what happened to Saul when the Spirit of God left him. And so he was saying to God, I sin. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. David was truly sorry for his sin. Saul was not so sorry for what he did. He had no godly sorrow. But David lay himself before the Lord, asking for forgiveness and restitution. So David served as a true model of, of repentance. He served as a model of true repentance. David was broken. He was sorry for what he did. He came to the point where he was willing to let go and say, Lord, I know I did wrong. He let go and say, God, I know I did wrong. Forgive me. He did not try to justify his wrongdoing. And this is what God requires from us. 
when Saul disobeyed the Lord's direct command. And the prophet Samuel went to confront him about his sin. Rather than owning up to his sin, Saul tried to justify his actions. He made excuses for his disobedience rather than owning his sin and asking for forgiveness. In, in pride, he argues that his sin was not, you know, that big of a deal. And he put, instead of owning the wrong thing that he did, he said it was the people. He made excuses. For his disobedience, rather than owning his sin and asking for forgiveness, he made excuse. Saul wanted to have his own way. Saul wanted to have his own way. But David wanted to please the Lord. Virgin, I am telling us that it's better we try to please the Lord. I must decrease and he must increase. Let us not try to, to, to satisfy ourselves. The, the, the ways of men are evil continuously. Con but look here. It, it's because we're serving God, it makes a difference, you know. We see the type of man that Saul started out as. But we see the type of man he became. But David wanted to please the Lord. David also started out well and sin. But he accepted his sin and repented. In summary, both men were anointed king. Both men were different. Saul wanted to have his own way while David wanted to please the Lord. David wanted to please the Lord. It came out in the many times, the often times David inquired of the Lord. When we look back, we recognize that Saul, there was only one time we saw when Saul attempted and it was just to show the people, it was a show to say to the people as if he was godly. And he called for the priest. He called for the Ark of the Covenant. But when he heard the noise in the Philistine camp, you know, he sent back the priest. But it was a good time still to inquire of the Lord. But because his heart wasn't into inquiring of the Lord, he sent back the priest. But when we look now at the life of David, David often inquired of the Lord. So both of them were different. Right? The people wanted a king. And God gave them a king after their own heart, which was King Saul. The people was far from God, and God gave them a man whose heart was far from him. So Saul started out with a bright future and sinned. On more than one occasion. But he wanted his own way. He did not want to repent. Even when he was confronted, he, he said, I have done the command of the Lord. The prophet had an hard time to get Saul to see that what he did was wrong. David also started out well and sinned. But David acknowledged his sin and repent, repented. Saul refused to repent. And David repented. King Saul and King David are foils of one another. In other words, Saul was rejected by God while David was a man after God's own heart. And to be a man after God's own heart, we did say 
that the Lord said this about David because David was willing to do his command. And because David was willing to do his command, he was willing to do his every will, he was considered a man after God's own heart. But his heart, his heart was kind. His heart was loving. Even when King Saul was after him, the man still loved King Saul. The man had nothing in his heart. He said, my master, the Lord's anointed, I could cannot stretch my hand against him. And the man wanted to take his life. Both men still, one was rejected and the other accepted. The question is tonight, the question tonight, where are we today in terms of our relationship with the Lord? Are we rejecting the Lord? Are we rejecting the commandment of the Lord? Are we rejecting the things of the Lord? Are we presumptuously, outrightly, neglecting the prodding of the Lord? Because the Holy Ghost prods us, tells us, you know, don't do this, don't do that, tells us what to do. And sometimes we willfully, the question is tonight, where are we? in terms of our relationship with the Lord. Are we rejecting? Are we doing like King Saul? If we live a life in disobedience to the command and commandments of the Lord, then we are no better than King Saul. And we might find ourselves in a devil's hell. Bible said it is not his will for any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. Virgin, we have looked at the life of both kings. We have seen that both of them started out well. We have see, seen that both of them. We have seen that. We have seen that both of them started out well. We have seen that. Both of them started out well. But at the end of the day, Saul was rejected from being king. It meant that the spirit of the Lord would depart from him. And David, it was said of him that he was a man after God's own heart. Where are we in our relationship with God? Is our hearts at the place where we are willing, where we are determined to do God's will, where we are determined to do God's every command? Or are we neglecting the commands of the Lord? I leave us with this question tonight. I hope that we ponder. I hope that you know, we get to the point where our determination, where our mindset would be to do whatever the Lord requires of us. The songwriter says, I'm going to live the way he wants me to live. I'm going to give until there is no more to give. I'm going to love until there is just no more. Virgin, at the end of the day, I want to hear, well done, to a good and faithful servant. What is it that you want to hear? God bless you tonight in the name of the Lord. Amen. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we bless your name tonight. We give you thanks. We honor you. We magnify you. We glorify your name. Mighty God, it's not your will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We pray, mighty God, that if our lives have been wayward, if we have been sinning willfully, Lord Jesus, we pray that you will forgive us tonight. We pray, God, that you will touch our hearts, that you will bring us back to that place, mighty God, where we can have a good relationship with you. We pray that you will bring our hearts to that place, mighty God, where we will... Embrace the things, God, that are set up 
oh God, to keep our souls. We pray, mighty God, for our leaders, Jesus. We pray, God, for our congregation, mighty God, that you will keep us and that you will cover us and that you will help us to, to live holy and righteously in your sight. Lord, we thank you for all we have said and we thank you for all that tune in and we pray that you will continue to bless. Let your will be done tonight. In Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God richly bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being with us over these past couple of weeks. I must confess, you know, that we had a lot of challenges. We had a lot of fight against, you know, the, the Bible study. You would know some of the things that happened, you know, from the start. But, you know, you know, God is with us. You know, bless up Brother Gary who is here Wednesday after Wednesday. You know, Sister um, Jennifer, you know, who signs, and Sister Sharon who signs, you know, you know, just for the things to happen. But we went through a whole lot. But nevertheless, you know, God is still a good God. God bless you in Jesus' name.